Everyone wants their all-inclusive vacation to be perfect. That's why we book them, right? To save ourselves lots of headaches and hassle. But sometimes things pop up that you're just not prepared for. Hey everybody, it's Vanessa and welcome back to my channel. And in today's video, I'm talking about all the unusual things that make people mad on an all-inclusive vacation. So you guys know what to be prepared for both before and during your trip to give you the best possible time. So let's check them out. So one of the first examples of things that upset all of us at all-inclusive resorts and can even ruin a stay is construction noise. Yes, you can encounter this at all resorts, but it seems to occur even more at all-inclusives as they tend to be bigger and construction and renovations usually happen piecemeal in sections because the properties are so big. So in many of my videos, I talk about how recently a resort was renovated, as well as how long it took, and usually it's in terms of years, so it can last quite a while. And the other issue is that many all-inclusive brands tend to put multiple locations right next to each other, so you can enjoy the amenities at a few different places, which is great. But because they tend to be so close together, if a sister property is undergoing construction during your visit, you'll probably hear it, even if you're not staying at that exact location. So how do you avoid this? Well, I like checking TripAdvisor reviews myself because people love to complain about construction noise here. They definitely don't hold back. So if an all-inclusive is going through recent renos or construction of any kind, that's a good place to find out. And another good place to check is directly with a resort representative. Most resorts now have instant chat on their sites, so I just mention the dates you're planning to stay and ask if any construction will be happening at that time, and you can change your plans or even ask for a specific location to avoid the noise, which sometimes makes a huge difference. So definitely something to consider before visiting and even before booking. I've seen many a trip ruined over construction noise tipping confusion. This is hands down the most discussed and asked about topic I've had in the three years of my channel and easily the thing that frustrates guests the most about all-inclusive resorts. And I've seen so much misinformation in the comments. It's actually much more straightforward when you book a regular resort, right? Because you just automatically tip. But it becomes more convoluted with all-inclusives because guests are told the tip is included. And many of us want to reward great service even further by giving additional tips. So many drive-by viewers leave comments saying, yes, you should tip extra. Others say, no, don't ever do it. And here's the truth that you might not want to hear. There's no blanket statement that's correct for all-inclusive tipping because every all-inclusive brand has a completely unique tipping policy. While pretty much all of them do include tip, some allow for extra tipping for all staff when they go above and beyond, others only allow for personally designated staff like your butler to receive extra tips, and other chains don't allow any extra tipping. And as many of you have discussed in the comments, this could even get staff fired, which defeats the purpose of rewarding them financially if they're just going to get fired as a result, right? So bottom line, do your homework on the brand that you're booking your all-inclusive trip with and see what their tipping policy is beforehand because it's a lot more important and complicated than you'd think. You don't wanna get anyone in trouble, but if you can reward hard work, you'll wanna be prepared with cash in hand. And also, the other big thing is how much do you give when it's allowed? I get asked that a lot. We tend to over tip and give about 35 to 40%, but there's really no right or wrong, especially when it's included. Anything extra is much appreciated. So hopefully this helps put the all-inclusive tipping question to rest, and I may do a video in the future explaining the differences in each of the main resort brands' tipping policies, or you could ask in the comments about a specific resort's policy so you're prepared before you go. Lack of culture. This isn't as upsetting of an issue as the tipping thing, but I have seen comments through the years of viewers asking, I went to an all-inclusive in Mexico, why wasn't there any authentic Mexican decor or artifacts, or why didn't my Jamaican all-inclusive have any local dishes on the menus? And I get it, but this is very much an all-inclusive issue. 
When you book an all-inclusive, you usually sacrifice a lot of the personalization and local touches that you're more likely to see in smaller, more individualized resorts. And the reason for that is since all-inclusive brands tend to have so many locations, they tend to have a template for the style of the brand that they really don't change, no matter where the location. So take the Ryu Resorts, for example. No matter where you book, all the rooms look exactly the same. Same color scheme, no local touches, that's just how most all-inclusive chains usually are. And it tends to be the same with on-site activities as well. You'll usually have some beach activities and yoga, maybe some scuba or dance lessons, but generally nothing that incorporates the local culture from the country you're visiting. There are some brands in Mexico that do a better job of incorporating local culture with cooking and Spanish lessons and many authentic pieces from local artisans, but that's definitely not the norm. Now, I have encouraged my viewers in the past to get out and explore the local area if you're looking for that authenticity and local flavor. But I do get that many of you don't feel comfortable with that, especially now on the heels of a global health crisis, so very understandable. But just set your expectations for the reality that while many all-inclusive brands have really upped their game with everything from dining to style and decor and even to on-site activities, they usually don't incorporate much from the local area into those things. So just be prepared so you're not disappointed and upset by that restaurant closures and this was an issue way before the pandemic many all-inclusive resort brands pride themselves on having plenty of dining options to choose from in your package on average they usually have 7 to 12 dining options and of course many of them have sister properties within walking distance that are also included in your rate but quite a few of them will be closed to any given time. And this is usually based on occupancy, which in my experience is directly related to what time of year you visit. So if you book an all-inclusive in the off season, there's a really good chance that at least a few of the restaurants will be closed. And this can be closed for just certain meals, they may serve lunch and not dinner or vice versa, or just closed period for your trip. And unfortunately, there's just no way of knowing before you arrive. And you want to talk about things that make people mad about it all inclusive? This might be the biggest one. Just take a peek at TripAdvisor and guests get really upset when dining options are randomly closed during their stay and definitely feel that they're not getting their money's worth. But I have to say for the most part, I still think that you are. My husband and I recently took a trip where we averaged $150 to $200 per dinner, and that can add up really quickly. So even if you have four or five dining options to choose from, and it's part of your all-inclusive package, while you may not have as many food options as you thought you were getting, you're still saving hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, depending on the length of your stay. So it's definitely the best spending option for dining on a getaway. So sticking with dining, now let's talk dining reservations. This is another aggravating thing about all-inclusives that you usually don't know till you arrive. So most all-inclusive resorts usually require dining reservations for at least some of their dinnertime meals. And my big tip, ask as soon as you check in what that individual resort's requirements are, because I've seen it vary by location even within the same brand. So more specifically, some all-inclusives require reservations at least a day in advance for all dinners, some only require reservations for a few of their restaurants, and others don't require them at all. And then you wait, and wait, and wait some more, until after a couple days you realize, I should just have dinner super early at like 5 o'clock, or we won't eat at all. And of course, room service is always an option. But your best bet is asking as soon as you check in and even making the reservations then and there for your entire stay. It's better to cancel later rather than get frustrated on your tip because getting reservations becomes a problem. Airport transportation. So now to the issue that personally frustrates me the most, let's talk airport transfer to and from your all-inclusive resort. So one of the big selling points from most all-inclusive resort brands is that unlike regular resorts, airport transportation is not only included in your rate, but you really don't even have to worry about booking anything. Just tell them your airline, arrival and departure dates and times, and you're all set. So this is the process I've gotten very much used to. 
until a few weeks ago. So even I'm still learning lessons about all-inclusive resorts that I can share with you guys. So I go to book what many consider to be the top two or three all-inclusive resorts anywhere and come to find out, guess what? Transportation was not included. It would be an extra $300. And not only was it not included, but it was much more complicated to get transportation and we were essentially on our own. Now, when I'm paying $7,500 for five nights for a lower tier room because your resort is so expensive, I expect a 25 minute ride to be included. I don't care if it's in a van with other guests, I'm fine with that, but I shouldn't have to pay for and arrange my own transportation when I'm paying that much. And for now, as silly as it may sound, it was a deal breaker for me. I'm not going to tell you which resort because I really like the place, but we ended up booking with another five-star resort that included transportation and was half the price, and it's one that I've talked a lot about on my channel. I do think a lot of this is actually dependent on the country that the all-inclusive is located in, especially if you're staying in a more dangerous area, and some of these brands don't want to deal with the liability should something happen. But regardless, that's my biggest gripe. If I'm paying that much money for such a short stay, I don't think it's asking for a lot to expect a ride from the airport to be included. So there you have the things that frustrate all of us about all inclusives. And if there's some I missed that you can give us all a heads up about, please let us know in the comments. But I still think that when it comes to value and a hassle-free vacation, all-inclusive is the way to go. I'd also like to hear if you feel comfortable getting back into travel, what videos you'd like to see on my channel, or if you're still not ready, all the reasons why. This is Vanessa for Passport Pages. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all very soon. Bye, guys.